Hello, and welcome to Library Seminars, a platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. Today's uh, library seminar is part of the 2021 Knauss Fellows Lunch and Learn series, a monthly webinar sponsored by NOAA Central Library that showcases this year's Sea Grant Knauss Fellows. Laura Inglesrud, Marine Mammal Conservation Fellow for NOAA Fisheries Office of Protected Resources, will be our moderator. She will tell you about the theme of our lightning talks and each introduce each of our five speakers. But before I hand the mic over to Laura, I do have a few logistical tips to help you enjoy our presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This, we will, this will reset the software and usually resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I've put the link to the channel in the chat box. All audience members are muted, but we want to hear from you, so please ask questions. We encourage you to type them in the questions chat box located in the control panel throughout the presentations while they're fresh in your mind. So let us know to whom the question is addressed by indicating the name of the person you'd like to answer it. And all of the questions will be answered at the end of the five presentations. So with that last detail, let's get started. The mic is yours, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the intro, Lisa. Um, as Lisa said, today we're going to have uh, five Knauss Fellows giving lightning talks about their 2021 Knauss experience across different federal government programs. And up first, we have Kenneth Erickson. Kenneth is a 2021 Knauss Fellow working with the NOAA Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. Kenneth grew up in North Carolina and graduated from North Carolina State University with a bachelor's in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology. Kenneth is a former NOAA Hauling Scholar and received his master's from Louisiana State University, studying the life history and how climate impacts juvenile recruitment of Southern flounder. Kenneth is interested in using science to inform legislation and policy that conserves marine ecosystems and increases our understanding of atmospheric processes. Okay, take it away, Kenneth. Thank you for that introduction, Laura. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about my year in NOAA's Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs, um, which has really provided the opportunity to sit between two branches of government, the legislative and the executive branch, and see how the science that NOAA does informs policy. So before I get started, I just wanted to give you all a sense of where the Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs sits. Most people are familiar with the six line offices uh, within NOAA, from our fishery service to satellites to the National Weather Service and the NOAA Corps. But there's also um, some staff offices and folks at the headquarters level that really kind of help to bring the agency's mission together and achieve um, that one NOAA, one NOAA mission. Um, and so we sit in the Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs sits in the Undersecretary's Office. So our job is really to help um, help coordinate activities that are going on um, at the line office level and then also at headquarters and hopefully advance NOAA's mission through the work that we do. So you all may be wondering what exactly is the role of an agency's Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs? And really, we serve as the official NOAA liaison to Congress. So that includes uh, communicating the administration's views and priorities um, to our partners on the Hill. We also help to plan, direct, and coordinate legislative initiatives for NOAA. Uh, and then a big part of our job is to notify Congress of NOAA developments. So if there's a new regulation that's going to be coming out or um, an update to a program or, you know, in the spring, usually we release the president's budget request. Uh, we want to make sure that Congress hears about that from us. And that includes both good news and unfortunately sometimes the bad news. But we really want to make sure we're being transparent uh, and letting them know um, what's going on. And then similarly, uh, through building relationships with uh, members and staff on the Hill, um, we sometimes will hear updates from them of maybe their priorities or a piece of legislation they're working on. And then we want to be able to let our NOAA and Department of Commerce leadership know about that um, so that we can kind of plan and really work with those uh, legislative partners. Another part of what we do is to prepare NOAA witnesses 
uh, for hearings, making sure that they know who's going to be at the hearing, what questions they might ask, um, and have the background on certain issues that are important to our members of Congress. Uh, and then really, as I've kind of mentioned, all these things come back to building relationships. And so that's what we spend a lot of our time doing is trying to build relationships uh, with both members and staff on the Hill uh, to really make sure that NOAA and Congress are working together um, to advance our mission. One of the things I've really enjoyed about this role is, and I think is a little unique, is that I have an opportunity to work closely with both legislative and executive canals fellows. So it's a good opportunity to meet folks who got placed in both sides of government. So just to give you an idea of some of the issues that we're working on, these are um, some, but certainly not a comprehensive list of the current uh, hot NOAA-related issues. Um, starting with, obviously, uh, FY22 appropriations. Back in the spring, we put out the President's budget request, uh, and now both the House and the Senate committees are working on um, their funding bills for the upcoming year. Uh, and we, some of you may be aware, but we currently sit under a continuing resolution um, to continue to fund the government until those bills pass. Um, another thing that's been making a lot of news are the infrastructure bills. So um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that, that recently passed uh, and was signed by President Biden and then um, the reconciliation process. Uh, we're involved with that, advocating for NOAA's priorities, um, you know, funding that may help fund NOAA infrastructure and NOAA projects. Um, so we work and respond to a lot of requests on that. One of the big priorities of this administration is climate. Uh, and so you can see we work on things like clients, climate science, adaptation, resilience, uh, wildfires, offshore wind, um, and the America, the beautiful, or the, the movement to con conserve 30% of lands and waters uh, by 2030. Equity is another big priority of this administration. So we have a lot of legislative work going on around equity, environmental justice, tribal engagement, uh, and unfortunately, sexual assault and sexual harassment is something that are, that has been an issue for NOAA in the past. And so we work uh, with Congress on ways to address that and improve uh, the workforce moving forward. Other things that NOAA is well known for, recreational fisheries management uh, and hurricane season are certainly things uh, that I've had the opportunity to work on. And then uh, another recent one is North Atlantic right whale. Uh, conservation is a is a topic on the hill as as NOAA tries to figure out how best to manage um, that population. So in a year in our office, uh, we typically handle about 25,000 emails and phone calls with members and staff. So we're in constant uh, daily communication uh, with our partners on the hill. Um, and this year alone, we've done over 450 briefings and meetings uh, with Congress. So that may be where we have a program or a priority that we want to make sure Congress knows about. So we offer them a briefing or it may be sometimes uh, Congress is working on an issue or they hear about an issue in the news and they want to know what NOAA is doing about it. And so we can provide a briefing that way as well. We typically have 15 to 20 uh, oversight and legislative hearings that we prepare for. And this week there were two. There was one uh, in House Natural Resources um, looking at legislation that would um, impact the Magnuson Stevens Act, which is how uh, NOAA manages a lot of our fisheries. Uh, and then also a nomination hearing uh, for a nominee um, within the administration. Uh, we track over 200 pieces of legislation related to NOAA and then something that kind of went away the last couple of years with the pandemic but has slowly started to come back our member and congressional staff trips and tours. Obviously members want to see what NOAA is doing in their district um, or in their state and so it's a great chance to get them out uh, to see NOAA resources. So you can see uh, these pictures my colleague uh, Becky who covers OMAO and the NOAA Corps had an opportunity to do a congressional visit to um, our a home port site in Ketchikan, Alaska with the Deputy Secretary of Commerce uh, Graves. And then on the right, uh, we took a member from Maryland to the National Center uh, for Weather and Climate Prediction in College Park, Maryland, and we're able to show them around the labs there. So my portfolio as a fellow has included everything from the FY22 budget rollout, uh, which has been a great insight into how the government um, funds activities. Uh, I also serve as the OLA representative on the Arctic Action Team, which coordinates uh, no activities in that region throughout the agency and keep track of anything that might be uh, relevant to their legislation or things that we should let Congress know about. Uh, no education is another one. They have a lot of local impacts, local programs and grants, so it's of great interest to members uh, and representatives. Um, 
you know, in the Caribbean is another one I help serve on and produce a, a newsletter and organize steering committee meetings where we hear from partners and NOAA staff about the work happening in the region. I also serve on the tribal team, the NOAA tribal team, which works on tribal consultation and uh, engagement with our First Nations and Indigenous peoples. And that's something that certainly has taken on uh, a new meaning and priority with the presidential memorandum that President Biden signed at the beginning of his term. Uh, and then the regional collaboration teams, which is a great way to meet our NOAA folks who are in the field. I've also been able to assist uh, with hearings, testimony, briefings, and lead a number of legislative priorities, as well as do things uh, like on the right, I had an opportunity to staff Admiral Hahn, who uh, is with the NOAA Corps um, on a trip out to Salina, Kansas. I know everybody's jealous. Salina, Kansas is the place to be. Um, but we were able to meet with Senator Moran and representatives from Kansas State University to discuss a, a pilot training program um, that's starting up at Kansas State. So finally, just to put this into the context of kind of my fellowship experience, um, even though most of the fellowship has been virtual, I've had the opportunity to staff trips to Alaska, South Carolina, and Kansas, which is a good opportunity to learn how to staff leadership, but also see our NOAA folks in the field. Um, I've led and supported 77 congressional briefings, and that's really helped me to develop my network as well, because a lot of times our role as a congressional affairs rep is to bring in the subject matter experts or the leadership who know that issue the best. So it's given me a chance to, to learn from a lot of different people this year. Uh, I also had a goal of expanding uh, kind of my knowledge this year from a fisheries background. So I've worked on a lot of atmospheric science and satellite issues and realized just how important those are to the work that NOAA does. And I've also gained legislative and budget experience. Um, and then one big difference from grad school to now is that in grad school, I spent a lot of time in a lab looking at fish and computer models. Um, but now a lot of my job is to manage that regular interpersonal and professional communication. So it's been a great opportunity to develop that skill set. Uh, that's all that I have, but be, I'll be happy to answer any questions as part of our panel uh, and look forward to hearing from uh, my next uh, fellow. Thanks so much, Kenneth. So up next, we have Arye Janoff. And Arye is a Canals Marine Policy Fellow with the United States House of Representatives Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation. It's a mouthful. He recently <laughs> completed his PhD in Environmental Science and Management at Montclair State University studying the coupling between geomorphology and economics to understand the drivers of urban coastal evolution. Arge is also involved in local government as the secretary of the Bradley Beach Environmental Commission, advises members of the Bradley Beach Council on sea level rise planning and policy, serves as the managing editor of the Canals Connector newsletter, and is an avid surfer and cyclist, passionate about ocean access and investment in bicycle transportation infrastructure. Okay, Arya, go ahead. Thanks, Laura. Uh, so, um, and thanks for a great for kicking it off, Kenneth. Um, I am going to change gears a little bit. Uh, I am on the legislative side of things, and I wanted to highlight the importance of utilizing our professional development funds uh, to get out into the field and learn firsthand. So um, this talk is going to take us from Seattle to San Diego um, across the West Coast, where I uh, built a tour of Coast Guard units and port facilities, among other uh, networking events. So um, as we know, um, this was the first year that we had to do our placement week in person. This is the legislative placement week right after we found out our placements um, on Google Meet. And uh, needless to say, we began our fellowship virtually, as did everyone else who started a new job during the pandemic. Um, and it was quite difficult to learn in this new professional landscape on the Hill and learn these new subject matter, uh, you know, these, these new subject areas, such as uh, ports, international shipping, Coast Guard, et cetera. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the early fellowship was quite busy. Uh, from the comfort of my home, I was able to work on numerous hearings uh, dealing with COVID-19 impact on the maritime industry, decarbonizing maritime, supply chain, uh, overview of and oversight of budget requests for our agencies of jurisdiction, the Coast Guard, Federal Maritime Commission, and Maritime Administration, often called MARAD. Uh, we also sent numerous letters to across different levels of government and internationally. Um, and then we also worked on legislation, 
uh, you know, of course, various briefings and meetings with members, leadership, stakeholders, uh, and agency heads, and dealt with advising member offices on reconciliation policy. Um, but like I said, it, it was difficult to start the fellowship virtually. And I often say that it's really hard to learn over a conference line. So what did I do? Um, well, I decided that over August recess and you know my team on the subcommittee for Coast Guard Maritime Transportation was super supportive of allowing me to go out into the field for a month and plan a West Coast tour of, oh, of Coast Guard units, ports, Army Corps and NOAA offices, as well as environmental nonprofits. And the objectives of this trip were to understand um, you know, on the ground uh, how the Coast Guard uh, and ports are dealing with infrastructure resiliency challenges to natural hazards and climate change. But more broadly, I also wanted to uh, give all of our stakeholders that we're building policies around a chance to explain their operations and challenges, how they engage with their communities, how they're dealing with the supply chain, what are their workforce issues, and what an ecosystem restoration or environmental mitigation program looks like on the ground level. And this gave me the opportunity to learn firsthand and really listen to Coast Guard service members um, and you know, port executives. And the result was uh, you know, a, an understanding of how important on the ground professional development is um, in order to complete the fellowship and uh, to inform policy development back at the committee. And a newfound appreciation for the service men and women of the Coast Guard who are executing our missions for public safety, environmental uh, response, uh, as well as national security. And on the right is just a, a, a spreadsheet of how I planned out my trip down to the driving distances and trying to fit in as many stops along the way. So I'm gonna dive right in because we're short on time here. So I started in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle and Tacoma where I hit Coast Guard base and station Seattle and I got a chance to see polar class icebreakers, polar sea and polar star. Um, one of them actually is decommissioned and the other one uh, just recently embarked on its mission down to the Antarctic. It's the only heavy uh, polar icebreaker that the Coast Guard operates. Um, and I also had the chance to tour ports of Seattle and Tacoma, cargo, cruise, commercial and recreational fishing operations. Uh, and that's me on a boat in the top center. Uh, then on the Olympic Peninsula in Port Angeles, I toured Coast Guard Port Angeles Air Station, uh, where I was able to hop into the MH-65 helicopter. Um, I saw an FRC, that's a fast response cutter, an 87-foot Marine Protector class cutter. And this location is very vulnerable to natural hazards, such as sea level rise, because it's located on a sand spit in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And in the top right image, you can see the natural hazards, the high wind environment, my hair blowing in the breeze. Uh, down the coast in Washington, at the mouth of the Columbia River in Cape Disappointment, I hit Station Cape D, where um, I, they took me out on a 47-foot patrol boat and actually let me drive it across the mouth of the Columbia Bar, which is often referred to as the Great Northern Pacific. So it's quite exhilarating, um, and I also had the chance to interact with uh, service members directly here and hear about their experiences in a remote boat station. In Portland, Oregon, uh, I hit Coast Guard Station, uh, Portland, where they let me drive a 29-foot uh, boat, a uh, patrol boat across the Willamette and uh, Columbia Rivers. And I actually steered it around Norwegian Cruise Line's Pride of America, which is the only US flagged cruise vessel in the world. Um, and then at the Port of Portland, they set me up in one of the port cranes. So those are the, the War of the Worlds looking cranes that load cargo on and off vessels. Um, and the top right two images are the views um, of a terminal as well as from the cockpit looking down at the contraption that actually picks up the cargo uh, container off the vessel. Um, and it is uh, not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's, you know, uh, <laughs> all of the floors are, are open view looking downward. Uh, in Newport, Oregon at Station Yaquina Bay, they took me out for a search and rescue training mission um, where they simulated man overboard and recovery as well as vessel uh, towing operations. Um, the top middle picture, you can see how they actually uh, hook up the tow line and tow a vessel in what were pretty mild conditions, but the swell was still around four or five feet. Wind was around 20 miles an hour. It was super foggy. So, you know, ultimate respect for uh, how they execute these missions in really adverse conditions in the Pacific Northwest and their facilities. This was my first opportunity to see 
the facilities degradation across the Coast Guard. Uh, many of their rooms and buildings uh, were condemned and they are in a high wind, high wave, foggy, wet environment, salt air, um, and it just shone a light on how the Coast Guard's facilities are uh, crumbling. In Coos Bay, I toured Coast Guard Station Coos Bay, where they took me out and I saw um, the the jetties adjacent to the inlet that are falling apart but recently got funding in order to rebuild them as well as the army corps dredge essayons dredging the inlet um, and then at the port of coos bay this is actually in chairman peter defazio the chairman of transportation infrastructure um, in his district and i was able to tour the port of coos bay with his district and personal staff and uh, coos bay is the primary exporter of timber in the pacific northwest as we all know um, you know, that's a major industry up there. Um, but they also own the rail line that takes the timber to Eugene. So they export it by sea, but also by rail. Um, and recently they invested in a fish ladder and dike system to help aid fish, uh, fish migration. Um, and they're also uh, maintaining and currently undergoing a repair project for a 1920 swinging rail bridge uh, that's kind of falling apart. So that's the bottom center image. In the Bay Area, I was able to tour Coast Guard Sector San Francisco, and I went on a 225-foot ocean-going buoy tender. That's the top left image, and also uh, bottom left, where they had me at the bridge, um, pointing out a navigational hazard. And then um, I, they took me out on an 87-foot cutter. Uh, bottom right, that's me with two coasties in front of the Golden Gate Bridge, and just above that, well underway, that's Alcatraz Island. And um, I also toured the Port of Oakland, they took me into the commissioner's room and showed me the beneficial reuse of dredge material project, uh, which also enhances public access for a environmentally, an environmental justice community nearby. In Morrow Bay, which is subcommittee chair Salud Carbajal's district, that's the subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation, I met with his district staff and we discussed the um, ongoing offshore wind development in the district. And I was also able to tour the harbor uh, patrol as well as the Coast Guard uh, small boat station. And surprisingly, they have recently only been able to uh, accommodate female service members because they actually didn't have enough space prior um, to have separate berthing and uh, staging areas for different service members. Um, and then down the coast a little bit, Santa Barbara and Port of Guaynimi, I was able to tour Santa Barbara Harbor, Santa Barbara Maritime Museum, and at the Port of Huaynimi, I toured uh, the port with uh, Salud Carbajal's district staff. And the Port of Huaynimi is actually, they call themselves the greenest port in America. Um, and they recently have invested in electric cargo handling equipment, electric trucks, um, electric cranes. So the middle right picture, that's me with district staff and Port of Huaynimi um, personnel in front of their newly purchased electric cranes, which is pretty cool. Down in LA and Orange counties, I. I hit Environmental Nonprofit Surfrider Foundation on the left and on the right, the Port of Los Angeles, uh, which is at the heart of the supply chain uh, news that we see going on right now. And the top right image, those are trucks with chassis that are lined up awaiting entry into the port. And on the bottom right, that's a partially automated uh, port terminal. Down in La Jolla, um, I met with Coast Guard Blue Tech Center of Expertise, which only recently opened in January of 2020 and they partner um, to try to expand partnerships with academia and industry and innovation um, on blue technology. So nat naturally they're housed in, at Scripps uh, where I toured Coastal Data Information Program, uh, multiple research labs, ESCUS, which is the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, um, and, and was able to put some of my science to use. And then finally, my last stop was down in San Diego, where I toured the port of San Diego, and they have this really cool oyster aquaculture uh, farming system that uh, pushes water over the filter feeders and aids in their growth. Um, they also have the bottom left, so that, that's the top left image. The bottom left is uh, e-concrete on riprap, which is a contraption that tries to create a living shoreline-esque type environment. Um, on what would normally be a hardened shoreline. They also have staging areas for the offshore wind turbines that will be used to, con you know, to construct the offshore wind farm off of Morrow Bay. And then I also toured uh, Coast Guard Sector San Diego, uh, where I met with their aids to navigation team, and we also discussed their drug and migrant interdiction uh, missions at the border. 
So what, is, what were some of the key takeaways from this trip? Um, because it wasn't all fun and games, it was really learning on the ground. Um, so the main takeaway that I got was that the Coast Guard shoreside infrastructure is crumbling and much of this infrastructure is mission critical and requires immediate investment. Um, and you know, on the congressional side, we are certainly supportive of that. Uh, and then additionally, the ports, if we want to meet our supply chain capacity and offshore wind development goals, uh, that the ports also need investment. So some of the policy responses that I won't take full credit for, but I you know, obviously helped my team with um, in the IIJA, the recently passed, we had money for shoreside infrastructure at the Coast Guard, money for port infrastructure, um, and then in Build Back Better, which will hopefully pass soon, um, we have shoreside infrastructure, climate change resilient shoreside infrastructure money, as well as supply chain resilience money for ports. Um, and all of this culminated uh, actually this week, this past Tuesday, uh, where my subcommittee staff um, asked what you know were, were some of the main takeaways from my trip and shoreside infrastructure in the Coast Guard. You know the Coast Guard's operating with a three billion dollar facility maintenance, repair, and recapitalization backlog, um, and about half of their facilities are past their 65 year service life. So this was an issue that we really wanted to highlight. Um, so. I, they allowed me to take that and, and run with it, and I led all components of hearing prep um, and hearing scoping and you know framing uh, what we wanted to talk about. And then I actually got a chance to sit in the hot seat next to Chair Carbajal, which who, who is immediately to my left in this picture on the right. Um, and I would say that the hearing was was a, a great success. So overall, um, you know, professional development on the ground. Uh, information gathering is really, really important, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Okay, thanks so much, Arie. Uh, up next, we have Will Claybor, and Will is a 2021 Canals Fellow coordinating the NOAA Ecosystem Indicators Working Group that maintains the National Marine Ecosystem Status website. And prior to the Canals Fellowship, Will completed his master's in marine resource management with a minor in risk quantification in marine systems at Oregon State University. Okay, take it away, Will. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you to Arie and Kenneth for the great uh, presentations beforehand, getting us kicked off. Um, like Laura said, my name is Will Claybor, uh, and I'm a uh, 2021 Knaus Fellow working with the Ecosystem Indicators Working Group. Uh, I'm technically shared between the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, the NOAA Fisheries IEA program, and uh, NESDIS National Center for Environmental Information. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what it means to be shared between uh, three different programs and three different line offices, uh, kind of how that works. And then I'll use these seven minutes to, to give a shameless plug for uh, the major project we've been working on uh, during the fellowship. Uh, before I get started, I want to actually start off with my main takeaways for the presentation. So uh, I'm going to start off by introducing myself and my role within NOAA, what it means to be uh, sort of in, uh, in a transdisciplinary role in my fellowship. Um, I want to share with you about the National Marine Ecosystem Status Portal, which is the main project I've been working on this year that we rolled out last month. Um, Basically, it's a resource that provides marine ecosystem status at a glance and access to NOAA sites for deeper dives, uh, kind of highlighting the fantastic work that uh, the NOAA programs and offices do. Um, and then uh, I'll end with uh, talking a little bit about how the site represents collaboration and bridge building within NOAA, uh, a lot of breaking down silos, as we like to say, and, and uh, some important things that that's taught me about uh, the work both within NOAA and uh, the type of work that I want to do moving forward past the fellowship. Um, and I wish I had more time today. I could run you guys actually through the website that I'm going to be talking about a little bit, but I highly encourage you all to go check it out yourselves. Uh, the URL is ecowatch.noaa.gov. You can also just Google National Marine Ecosystem Status. So this is me. Uh, I was originally born in Western New York. Uh, that's the great city of Rochester up there in the top left. And, uh, from there, I, I went to the University of Maryland. I, I knew I wanted to study uh, the interaction between humans and environmental systems, but I didn't really know what that meant. Uh, so I went to Maryland, figured it was close to a big city, close to uh, some cool opportunities, um, great big school. And I studied uh, environmental science and policy and economics. Um, once again, not really knowing what I was going to do with that, uh, just 
hoping it would kind of get me close to uh, these things that interested me, which were the interactions between humans uh, and the environment. Um, from there, I was lucky enough to get picked up by NOAA as part of the Howling Scholarship Program as a sophomore, and I did a fantastic field season in uh, beautiful, beautiful Juneau, Alaska, up there working with some researchers at University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, and uh, some folks in the NOAA Regional Office up there. Uh, and that kind of set my path uh, moving forward for ocean science. Um, but even then, I, I didn't really have a traditional background for an ocean scientist. I had never taken uh, an ocean or atmospheric science course. Uh, I, I was not a fisheries person, um, and I wasn't really committed to doing uh, sort of fisheries economics or, or any of that type of work. And so um, I was really sort of uh, trying to figure out what that meant for me and what that meant for my career moving forward. And I was very, very lucky to find a great group of researchers and a great program at Oregon State University uh, called the Marine Resource Management Program that really embraced uh, the transdisciplinary approach to ocean science and science in general and uh, saw me as sort of an opportunity to refine that approach and, and put it into practice as someone who was not really specialized in anything but uh, uh, kind of focused on doing a little bit of everything. Um, I had a great two years there working with uh, a fantastic early career faculty, uh, some great coursework, um, and from there I was lucky enough to get the Canals Fellowship. Um, and when I was interviewing for positions, uh, I was really interested in following through on that and looking for positions that gave me an opportunity to uh, try my hand at a lot of different projects and work with a lot of different types of people who have different types of expertise. Um, and so I was lucky enough to end up as uh, the Ecosystem Indicators Fellow for the National Marine Ecosystem Status website, um, which I'll explain a little bit more about uh, in a second. Um, but like I mentioned before, I technically live within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and I have advisors within uh, the Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Program and NESDIS, um, and I'm very lucky that my position allows me to work on a handful of projects uh, beyond the website that I'll be talking about today uh, in those offices and work with uh, some fantastic and brilliant people there. Um, so hopefully that gives a little bit of context for, for who I am and where I'm coming uh, from when I'm talking to you guys today. Uh, it's a little bit non-traditional, but I'm pretty proud of it, and hopefully it's a, a contrast from some of the other presentations. So now getting into our major project in that, that National Marine Ecosystem SAS website that I was talking about before. Um, as a hypothetical, let's say you're uh, some sort of stakeholder, maybe uh, an undergraduate student or a staffer for a policymaker uh, who's interested in figuring out uh, what the ocean is doing in your district or outside of your hometown, um, and you'd like to get some access to some data that gives you a sense of, of how the ocean is doing. Well, you know to go to NOAA because it's it's uh, the federal agency that deals with our oceans and coasts, and you know that we have a great suite of uh, data indicators. We're the ones who collect and store that information. Uh, but if you were to go and just simply Google chlorophyll NOAA or any other uh, sort of data source from NOAA, you'll notice that there's a, a large number of programs that work with uh, different types of information, a large number of portals, um, and, and there isn't really one clear access point for uh, all of the data that NOAA collects and, and presides over. Um, and even if you were to be able to access that data or know where to go, a lot of times that data is in a format that isn't necessarily conducive to uh, consumption by members of the public. And so therefore, you're relying on uh, scientists or people who are trained in ocean science to be able to uh, collect and interpret that information for you. So this was a common issue uh, for people who worked sort of in ecosystem-based management or ecosystem-based approaches within NOAA Fisheries and within NOAA more broadly. They were getting a lot of calls from people um, both inside NOAA and outside of NOAA asking about where to find specific indicators and, and looking for ways that they can collect that information, manipulate it on their own, and use it for uh, products and decision making. Um, so this was a big issue. And so uh, Dr. Jason Link, who's the chief scientist for ecosystem science within NOAA Fisheries, went to NOAA's Science Council um, and uh, basically secured funding uh, for uh, a project where he would be in charge of leading a working group that would create a web-based platform uh, to host uh, the most important indicators uh, and data that NOAA produces and uh, presides over um, and make it accessible to members of the public by geography, by theme, um, and to create a national status for waters of the United States for all these important indicators, um, with the target audience being end users, uh, people in undergraduate, uh, people who aren't necessarily uh, ocean scientists themselves. Um, the other thing we really wanted to emphasize with this was that 
uh, we're not trying to, to sort of take any of the shine away from the programs that work hard on collecting and uh, analyzing this data, but rather use it as a diving board to move members of the public away from our website uh, and into actual program office websites or uh, data portals so that they can get that information uh, by themselves. Um, and so over uh, four years, uh, Dr. Jason Link uh, created uh, the Ecosystem Indicators Working Group, which comes from uh, all the different line offices of NOAA. I hope if you work at NOAA and you're looking over this list, there's a very good chance you see a name that you recognize or it's somebody that you've worked with. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on the interdisciplinarity of the group and make sure that there was a diverse uh, number of programs and perspectives that were included. Uh, I do want to shout out, if you look down there in the bottom right, our wonderful uh, MC, Laura Inglesrud, has been a member of the group uh, over the last year. So thank you, Laura, for participating. Uh, and like I said, I wish I had more time to actually give you guys a tour of the portal, but if you go to ecowatch.noaa.gov, uh, you can click through yourself. Um, hopefully you see some data that you've worked with in the past, or maybe your program has collaborated with us uh, in the past and getting your data up onto the website. Um, like I mentioned before, it's scalable by geography, so it's uh, cut out to the large marine ecosystem scale. You can also sort it thematically, so by looking at uh, biological indicators uh, and comparing those, or uh, physical chemical indicators. Um, and then one of the really novel and unique things that I mentioned is that we, we do have a national status uh, page on this website. Uh, which is the first time that NOAA's actually presented um, indicators like uh, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, um, other indicators like that, all in one place at a, a national scale, at, focused at the public, uh, so that people can really get a sense of what's going on in the waters of the United States. And so uh, that's one thing I think is really cool about this project. Um, another unique thing about the project that we work really hard on is making sure that there's a consistent and uh, easily digestible approach to displaying the data. And so uh, we borrowed some ideas from the Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Program, and we basically boiled all of our data down into these uh, really cool time series that come along with these glyphs that give end users a good sense of how each indicator is doing relative to the entire time series of data that we have uh, for each of the indicators. Um, as you can see here, the, the time series have uh, 10th and 90th percentile bars built in, uh, as well as a uh, trend uh, indicators that give a sense of the slope over the last five years relative to the entire time series. We also have these gauge plots um, that give uh, the mean value over the last five years as a percentile rank of the entire time series, uh, basically to give uh, the end users a sense of whether or not a, an indicator is increasing, decreasing, or staying the same over the last five years. Um, also, if you click onto the website, um, we've taken great lengths to and worked with a lot of great communication specialists to uh, interpret the data and make sure that uh, all the data is uh, very clear uh, for those who are going to be digesting it. So if you go to the website and you click on a time series, we'll have plain language summaries of the data for every single indicator. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of plain language summaries were written by uh, the members of the working group to make sure that the, the data is coming through to everybody uh, clear and concisely. So what have I learned from my position? Um, like, I'm going to come back to this this idea of transdisciplinarity um, for a couple of reasons. One, because I consider myself to be transdisciplinary. I, I see the value in uh, having a large number of uh, disciplines and people with different backgrounds uh, uh, working on a project together like this. There's a lot of value in that. Um, and we talk about diversity and inclusion in uh, a cultural sense quite a bit. But from a disciplinary sense, it really adds uh, a lot of value to projects like this. Um, and I think there's a lot of value to be had within NOAA um, when it comes to breaking down silos between programs uh, and sort of putting uh, programmatic politics aside for a little bit to, to work on projects like this. Um, great things can happen. Um, I've done a lot of project management, uh, which was not something I expected to do during the CANAS Fellowship, but it's a really valuable skill that uh, I've, I've taken away from my uh, experience here. So um, front-loading time spent on organization and note-taking can really save time in the end when working on a project of this scale um, and when there's so many moving parts. Um, and then finally, communication and over-communication. There's no such thing as over-communicating something, especially when, uh, like I said, you're working with a lot of uh, moving parts, you're working with a lot of busy people uh, who have a lot on their plate. Um, and uh, I think that was my last slide. Um, I want to thank my mentor, Steve Gidding, Scott Cross, Ellen Spooner, as well as Jason Link and Chris Kelbel, who are uh, the coordinators of the working group. Um, and then thank you to Haley, Laura, and the rest of the Lunch and Learn team for having me on today. 
and I hope I didn't go too far over time, but I'll pass it back to you, Laura. Thanks so much, Will, and thanks for the shout out. It's definitely been a nice bonus to my own fellowship to be on the working group. So um, let's see. So next up, we have Caleb Taylor. And Caleb is a fellow with the United States Committee on the Marine Transportation System, working with the diverse portfolio within the interagency. Caleb studied marine biology at Southern Miss and renewable natural resources at LSU with a thesis focused on understanding impacts to blue crab population dynamics from altered hydrology from river diversions in coastal Louisiana. Caleb also has experience as a commercial crabber and deckhand aboard a 72 foot landing craft in Alaska and as a field biologist in Texas. His interests lie in keeping our oceans healthy by conserving marine resources and fostering a resilient and sustainable marine transportation system. Okay, go ahead, Caleb. Thank you, Laura. I don't. I don't think I could have really said it better myself. I don't. I don't know if I even need to go through this PowerPoint anymore. But uh, thank you for that. My my experience was a lot. Uh, there's there's Helen Brohl. So thanks thanks for that. The executive director of the CMTS. Everyone. So I I have uh, on the screen here uh, in my background. This is actually a steam engine that was knocked off the tracks during a snowstorm or Arctic storm uh, around Nome, Alaska. And so believe it or not. Uh, railroad is actually a part of the marine transportation system. Just a, a little fun takeaway from this. So if you learn anything, know that it, this this one in particular is much uh, past its time and no longer part of the marine transportation system. But at one point, uh, it you know it had a good time probably. So moving on, let's see if I can change this. Okay, so just a, a brief, briefly, I'm going to go over what got me interested into the CMTS. Um, and before I go into a brief introduction of the Committee on the Marine Transportation System, what it is, as well as a snapshot, a small snapshot of my portfolio. So, you know, uh, I, I think Richard Henry Dana kind of worded it pretty uh, funnily, for lack of a better term. Uh, he was the author of Two Years Before the Mast, an American novel back in the day. He was a uh, a college student that went to sea for two years, but he, he believed that there was a witchery in the sea. It's songs and stories and the mere sight of a ship. I uh, don't know if I agree with him about the sailor's dress, but uh, to a young mind, which has done more to man navies and fill merchantmen than all the press gangs of Europe, which uh, I don't know if they have press gangs anymore, but regardless, there is something about the sea that drives folks to you know be interested in it and want to work out there. And, and nonetheless, that had a, a big effect on me as a child. And so um, at LSU, you know, Laura kind of mentioned what I did there, but since then I, I graduated in the summer of 2020 and I was fortunate enough to go experience firsthand uh, parts of the marine transportation system in Kodiak, Alaska. And so working on a landing craft, uh, delivering freight and fuel to some of the remote villages around the Kodiak archipelago, working as a commercial Dungeness crab fisherman there, I am laying with a bunch of my friends, about four tons of them. And uh, it was a great experience and it really opened up this world to me that I didn't have uh, an insight into beforehand being a fisheries ecologist. And so uh, I, it led me to wanna to learn more about the vast marine transportation system, what makes it tick, as well as the federal oversight of it. And so whenever I came across the CMTS uh, as a position within the Canals Fellowship, it just kind of clicked for me. And so federal oversight uh, for different modes of transportation with air, you have one particular administration, same thing for highways, same thing for rail, FRA. But with maritime, there's actually over 30 federal agencies and offices that have a hand in it. I mean, think of Navy, Coast Guard, NOAA, as we've heard from earlier, right? And so um, how do you make sure that they stay on the same page? And how do you make sure that all these issues that affect multiple agencies are worked on in a actual, <laughs> Um, you know, collaborative way and uh, effective way rather to get things done. And so that's where the CMTS comes in. And we, they've been there since 2005. So the CMTS is actually an interdepartmental policy coordinating committee, uh, cabinet level tasked with policy coordination uh, of the marine transportation system. And so very important in that regard no presentation would be complete without an org chart, right? So this is the org chart. You don't have to soak it all up. Uh, I really just wanted to mention down at the bottom, 
bottom left for me, maybe bottom right for you, but the integrative action teams is where we get a lot of our work done. And so as part of my portfolio, I've staffed, I'm the staff lead for the Arctic Marine Transportation Integrative Action Team, as well as the Maritime Innovative Science and Technology IAT. Uh, we've had a few more topics come up then that I've been curious about, and so that kind of led me to working with environmental justice, as well as offshore energy facilitation and ocean policy, but I'll mention that a little bit later. And so, you know, it's it's really been a wild year in, in the best way possible in, in support of uh, Arctic Transportation IAT. And so um, there's a couple of, so I, I work on quite a few different topics, um, making sure that our meetings are staffed and coordinated and um, I facilitate them, these monthly meetings in support of our um, action teams rather. And so, uh, you know, one big project that I was working on that's uh, taken about the whole year to do is a compendium of, on risk assessments and reports related to Arctic infrastructure U.S. Arctic infrastructure, rather, to inform federal investments and decisions in the region. And in support of that, I was able to travel up to Nome, Alaska, and Kotzebue, as well as Juneau and Anchorage. Um, so you can see the the top two pictures there, the one with the boat that's in Nome, and uh, really learn about what these uh, different folks on the ground up there uh, think the federal government should be doing as far as marine infrastructure investments. Um, I was also able to go to the Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik, Iceland, in support of my professional development. It was a fantastic networking opportunity. I got to meet with some of the uh, big leaders in Arctic policy in the U.S. today. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And there, at the bottom there, you have, uh, that's me with um, the Greenland iceberg that somehow ended up over there. It was a climate activist kind of thing. And, uh, and as well as me holding a cup of skir, which is an Icelandic yogurt that is delicious. And, uh, and needless to say, it was a good time. I didn't get a lot of pictures, but it was a great time. And um, I've had a lot of good experience on the Arctic IAT, working with our many agency partners, including NOAA, U.S. Coast Guard, and the Maritime Administration. And terrible picture of the Aurora Borealis up there, but I was fortunate to see it while I was in Reykjavik. And so the another part of big chunk of my portfolio is working with the Maritime Innovative Science and Technology Integrative Action Team. So the bottom left there is uh, we, we held a conference in March that was a huge success, I think. We had quite a few different panelists and big time speakers, or big name speakers, rather. And uh, so I worked to put together a team of note takers, and I'm currently compiling a summary and list of recommendations for the CMTS to use for uh, to inform research and development and the work plan moving forward, uh, particularly as it relates to, the, relates, <laughs> rather, to this topic of automation and autonomous technologies <clears throat> in the MTS. And, you know, I, I've also done a lot of work with that. We bring in speakers uh, for our monthly meetings uh, um, on topics ranging from alternative fuels, such as hydrogen fuel cells, to autonomous technology and a lot more. And it's it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed working with these different agencies and kind of getting to know the different cultures of the different agencies that we work with as well. Um, and recently, environmental justice has been a big topic. We've put on two webinars so far that I've organized and uh, helped facilitate um, related to sharing best practices and resources among our partner agencies. And another topic that's pretty cool that we're working with now is facilitating offshore wind energy um, in the U.S. And so a big problem that kind of arose was dealing with unexploded ordinances out there and federal guidance to do so. The traditional guidance was to avoid them, but we can no longer do that. And so Bessie actually came to the CMTS to bring partners together and try to find a solution to figuring out federal guidance to this problem. And so we've been working on that quite a bit lately, and it's it's been really interesting. It's very important work, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And you know, with that, it's it's really important. I, I won't list uh, the number of the things that I've done. It's it's just it's been a lot of fun dipping my toes into marine transportation policy. I've learned a lot about project management, meeting facilitation, uh, strategic networking, uh, as well as the different agencies' cultures that I work with. And uh, I've, it's been I've been very fortunate to work with some very passionate people in the federal government, and I, I think that you know, extends at a broader scale of what more than what I've just experienced. But, uh, you know, I'll give a shout out to the members of the CMTS, Helen Broll, who you met briefly earlier. Thanks for that, Helen. Um, she's the executive director, Pat Mutchler, Heather Gilbert, Chase Long, Kelsey Sunquist, Ross Reddington, our fall intern, 
Nanza Jane and all the members of the agencies that we work wow. with. It's really been a fantastic oh, year. So and as I sail off into the sunset of my Canals Fellowship, I'm very thankful for what I've experienced thus far. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I listed my uh, LinkedIn name Perfect. there as well as my email address. So Laura, I'll hand it back to you and Liz. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Caleb. So last but certainly not least, we have Susie Webster up. And Susie serves as the Stakeholder Engagement and Communication Specialist in NOAA's Technology Partnerships Office. And she recently received her PhD from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, where she researched stakeholder engagement in environmental research and management. Prior to joining NOAA, Susie worked on a team of science communication professionals at the Integration and Application Network and earned a bachelor's degree in biology and anthropology from the University of Notre Dame. Okay, Susie, bring us home. Hello, um, thanks, Laura. And um, hi, everyone, my name's Susie. I'm really excited today um, to tell you about my office and my role there and a little bit about the outreach plan that I've been working on. So I've learned that there's a lot of people um, who are not familiar with what the technology partnership is or what we do. Um, so I'd like to just start with a quick overview of my office. Um, so TPO is basically NOAA's research to commercialization office. So what does that mean? Um, basically, there are many ways that new research can be transitioned or applied um, so that it can serve multiple purposes outside of the original research context. Um, and then one of those ways is to transition research to the commercial market. Um, so on the commercial market, technologies can then be put to use by a wider community. So TPO is the group within NOAA that facilitates all of NOAA's research to commercialization activities. So TPO has two congressionally mandated programs that help fuel innovation at NOAA. First, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, um, which we call SBIR, um, invests in small businesses and that helps them develop products and services that have strong commercial potential, but also um, are aligned with NOAA's mission. So this startup funding helps the economy and it helps small businesses, but it also directly benefits NOAA because it stimulates um, the innovation of technologies that further our mission. And then the second program at TPO is the Technology Transfer Program. Um, so this program facilitates public-private partnerships, um, which allow NOAA to collaborate and innovate with non-federal partners. Um, and if you've ever heard of CRADAs or Cooperative Research and Development Agreements, um, TPO is the group that manages all of those for NOAA. Um, we also manage NOAA's intellectual property. So anytime a NOAA scientist invents a new uh, piece of technology, for example, um, we're the people that help them to figure out how to best protect that intellectual property and transition that technology um, to other agencies, um, academia, and the private sector. So once the technology is transferred, um, NOAA can continue to fo focus on our science, our research, our services, um, but the technologies don't just get stuck in the labs and instead they can be further developed and commercialized so they can better serve the US public. Um, and lastly, uh, lastly, because I know how much NOAA loves its org charts, um, TPO sits within the Office of Research Transition and Application, or ORTA, um, which is a new office uh, within the NOAA uh, research. Um, so even though we fall within OAR technically, um, TPO actually serves all of NOAA line offices. So that brings me to my position in my office. Um, so I'm the stakeholder engagement and communication specialist. And what that means is my job has two big parts. And the first is all the day-to-day -day, um, communications tasks. So I write articles for our website, um, which highlight different commercialization successes across NOAA. Um, I announce different um, funding opportunities and other stuff like that. Um, and one of the highlights of this part of my job was writing a story for NOAA.gov earlier this year, which was really fun. Um, and the, the cover of that story is uh, on the slide. Um, I also compile newsletter items and I send them to a bunch of different people so everyone can know our TPO news. Um, I manage our social media, um, help make presentations, um, write internal memos that kind of keep 
people within NOAA informed on what our programs are up to. Um, and then I coordinate with other communicators across NOAA um, to cross promote different stories that highlight NOAA's technology partnerships. And then the second part of my job is a bit bigger picture and involves um, longer time frames. So I'm responsible for identifying TPO's key stakeholders for both the SBIR program and the tech transfer program. And then basically figuring out ways that we can um, most effectively keep them engaged and develop those relationships further. Um, so we can do this by using strategic messaging that addresses particular stakeholder needs, um, using social media and other communication channels and so on. So all of this part of the job involves a lot of research-based strategizing, um, a lot of coordination and relationship building, which other fellows have talked about today. Um, so the biggest project that I worked on this year is creating a stakeholder engagement plan for TPO. And it's still a work in progress. I'm still um, kind of finishing it up, but I've conducted just over 50 interviews um, to collect data on all of our stakeholders' needs and their experiences with um, interacting with our programs. And I have synthesized all of this feedback from our stakeholders to create this engagement plan, um, which will inform how TPO goes about communicating with our stakeholders in the future. So our communication strategy will be different for people um, who interact with our programs mostly from within NOAA um, versus outside of NOAA. So I've separated the plans into two complementary halves. So I've only completed the in-reach in, in plan so far, so the stakeholder engagement involving people within NOAA. Um, and I'm working on the outreach plan now, kind of synthesizing all of the um, feedback from small businesses and other stakeholders outside. Um, but each half of the plan will eventually um, have an outline of TPO's current challenges and an engagement strategy and communications plan that will help us work towards more effectively meeting our stakeholders' needs that they've expressed. So this is our draft strategy, um, just a snippet of it for how we think our office can better engage people within NOAA going forward. Um, this in-reach plan is a visual um, summary of about 30 interviews with people all across NOAA and about 35 pages of research synthesis documents that are written. Um, so you can see on the left that one of our first priorities is just to make sure that more people inside NOAA are aware that TPO exists and aware of what our programs do. So I hope that this program, this presentation is kind of a sneaky way to start contributing towards um, achieving that goal because hopefully now all of you know a little bit about um, TPO. Um, and then I wanted to end um, as we're running out of time. <laughs> Um, by encouraging all of you to reach out to TPO if you think we might be able to help you with any of your research to commercialization efforts. So you can email the team at the address on the screen. Um, you can read success, uh, success stories about research to commercialization um, transitions that we've done. And you can follow us on Twitter where we post all of our updates at NOAA Innovate. Um, and please be on the lookout if you're inside NOAA, um, please be on the lookout for future training opportunities and resources that'll help you learn more about CRADAs, uh, managing intellectual property and other research to commercialization topics. And then if you wanna contact me or follow up on this presentation or share your perspectives as a stakeholder um, or ask any questions, my email's at the bottom here and I'm more, to happy, and I'm more than happy to connect. Um, I also have a LinkedIn. Um, so I'd like to close by thanking my colleagues at TPO and everyone that has helped coordinate this Lunch and Learn series and to all of you for your attention for all of our talks. Thank you so much, Susie. I really appreciate your time. And um, we actually have come to the end of the hour. Um, I do encourage you, uh, audience, uh, if you do have questions, please type them in the questions chat box in the control box now. And even if we don't have time to answer them live, uh, I encourage you to uh, send them because we can always answer them offline. Uh, if the, all the fellows could pop up for a second. Um, while we're waiting for potential questions, I also wanna let people know that we have most of the presentation slides uh, available as handouts. So if you look at the control panel, uh, and you're interested in, in having any of the slides that you saw today, uh, which includes contact information, uh, please download them from the handouts uh, menu. And last but not least, don't forget we're recording this 
and there's a lot of good information here about some very inspiring people. I, I think your uh, fellowships are really interesting. Um, so please pass on the link to this webinar to anyone you think might be interested. We'll be uploading the presentation uh, in a few hours uh, on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel. And again, that link is in the uh, chat box. So I didn't have any questions so far, um, but I did have one comment. I think it was for Caleb, and I think you'll know what this means. It says, go Tigers. <laughs> uh, don't forget audio. I, yeah, I'm on. Uh, yeah. yeah, go go Tigers, LSU. So thanks. shout out, shout <laughs> out right. to uh, the Tigers. Excellent. Uh, all right, so let's give it another second. But did you, did anybody have any last second um, comments before we close off for the day? No. All right. Well, just great I agree. job, everyone. Uh, Susan. I agree. <laughs> I just wanted to say great job, everyone. Laura with uh, facilitating and uh, Susie and Will and Kenneth Arye. Great to hear about your fellowships. Um, awesome. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone for sharing their research um, with their various programs, as well as Laura for moderating and the Knauss Fellows Webinar Committee for organizing this, this series with um, NOAA Central Library. We are very proud to host presentations like today's that feature the work of the Knauss Fellows and the NOAA community. And we hope you will join us again for the next Knauss webinar, which will be on December 16th at noon Eastern Standard Time. Be well, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you.